adaptation and statistics for mass spectrometry and proteomics. We are very happy to have you back and we're very happy to uh, focus this week on all things R and R-based tools uh, for quantitative mass spectrometry and proteomics. And so today and tomorrow, we dedicate our discussion to MS stats and the workflows which exist uh, around uh, MS stats. Maybe before we start, just a little bit of uh, logistics. So if you're joining us via Zoom, then at the bottom of your screen, you see uh, two buttons. So one button is chat, and you can use this chat to talk to the moderators and also to all the participants, but please use it for logistics questions. Like for example, uh, I cannot find the slides, I can't hear you, you know, or something like that. On the other hand, if you have questions regarding the actual presentation, please use the Q&A button because the Q&A button uh, allows us to manage the questions uh, better and it alerts me in a way that uh, the speaker or the organizers can respond uh, more easily. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions as we go. So uh, today uh, I will start uh, presenting MS stats. My name is Olga Vitek. I'm a faculty in the Curie College of Computer Science at Northeastern University. I'm a statistician by uh, training. I have my PhD in statistics from Purdue. Then I did one year postdoc in the lab of Woody Ebersold at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. Then I went back to Purdue as a faculty, as an assistant professor and an associate professor. And now I'm very happy to be here at Northeastern in computer science. And our second speaker is Mina Choi. So what we will do is I will uh, start by introducing the methods implemented in MS stats and then uh, Mina will do the uh, demo. So I will introduce Mina when we get closer to her part. So let us go ahead and get started. And again, don't please don't hesitate to um, to ask questions. So uh, MS Stats is a project which exists now for uh, 14 years or so. So it's been already quite a while. And so I would really like to acknowledge first the main contributors to MS Stats. So Mina Choi, who is the leader of the project. And we have very substantial contributions from Eral, Ting, and Sung Heng. And also we have a whole group of former and current group members who are also active contributors and uh, their work is uh, very important for us. So before we start, uh, I would like to um, talk about the fact that why reproducible uh, research is important and why we really want to think about reproducibility when we think about statistical methods and statistical analysis with MS stats or other methods for that matter. And so I really like to emphasize that reproducibility, well, first of all, it's something that we want to have, right? But at the same time, it is not a thing, it's actually a uh, spectrum. So on one side of the spectrum, it is work which is publication only once published, nobody can reproduce it. So this is not what we want. And then there are different levels of reproducibility. So first we want to make sure that we can repeat the analysis which already have been done by ourselves or by someone else, meaning that if somebody analyzed the data set and we obtained some results, we should be able to repeat the same analysis and have exactly the same numbers back from a second iteration of exactly the same work. But this is not enough because there's not just one, but usually there are many ways to go uh, about uh, statistical analysis problems and many of these ways are equally reasonable. They make slightly different assumptions, slightly different decisions, but fundamentally these are reasonable ways of uh, dealing with data analysis. And so the hope is that we could do reproducible data analysis when we use different equally reasonable methods or the equally reasonable software. We may not have exactly the same numbers back, but we should have qualitatively the same conclusions from these analysis. And this is important, but this is still working with the same data set. And what we really want is to be able to repeat the experiment where we take the same biological material, reanalyze this on the instrument, reanalyze it computationally and have qualitatively the same results. And the gold standard of reproducibility is when we actually take new biological samples from the same problem and we reanalyze this experimentally, reanalyze this computationally and qualitatively have the same conclusions. And so what I would like to argue that statistical mindset 
helps us address all the aspects of reproducibility across the entire spectrum. And so on the repeatable data analysis side, we need to have workflows which are documentable, automated, but also fully transparent so that it's clear what was done. So if somebody wants to re-implement the same analysis in a different program language or in a different kind of type of uh, software or package, it should be possible. In terms of reproducible data analysis, we want to make sure that conclusions depend as little as possible on the decisions made by data processing tools. We also want to make sure that we have the models which handle variation appropriately. And on this side of spectrum, statistical mindset is really important for things such as making sure that our workflow is actually suitable for purpose. So the assays can actually capable of quantifying what we would like to quantify. The system is stable and usable with the quality control, but also the experimental design on the biological side of things where we select the right number of biological and technical replicates and the right type of biological and technical replicates and specify standard operating procedures uh, for the entire workflow. And so MS stats contributes to the whole spectrum uh, of reproducibility, but today I would focus primarily on the software and data analyzing on repeatable and reproducible data analysis. So this is how we usually view the workflow for uh, statistical aspects of design and analysis of mass spectrometry based experiments. So of course, once we collect the data, we need to process the data, we need to model the data, do statistical analysis, and we need to use this information to infer or inform uh, future experimental designs. But at the same time, this is the part which really contributes. So this contributes to repeatability and this contributes to reproducibility. So analytical method validation, system suitability and experimental design. So what exactly MS stats uh, currently, can currently do? So, well, first of all, MS Stats is an R-based open source uh, software for quantitative proteomics. It started as a R and bioconductor package, but by now it evolved into a um, ecosystem where we have a family of packages which are used uh, for different purposes because we now realize that not everybody needs all the functionalities at once. And also historically because different aspects of the workflow were developed uh, at different times in the group. And so at this point, MS Stats is really an ecosystem rather than an individual uh, package. So at the core of the biological question, we can think about, okay, which proteins change in abundance? And MS Stats can handle complex designs, including factorial experiments, where you look at combination of multiple factors together. You can look at designs which have some sense of repeated measurements, for example, paired design, or a time course, a byproduct of MS stats is an abundance of each subject on a relative scale. So if you have a biological replicate that is quantified with multiple peptides or multiple uh, fragments or transitions, uh, and maybe in multiple technical replicate runs, uh, a byproduct of MS stats is an estimation of protein abundance on a relative scale per protein per subject, so that we have one number per uh, protein per subject. So in terms of the experimental workflows, uh, MS stats is applicable to uh, label-free experiments and data-dependent acquisition, uh, data-dependent DIA, SWAS, um, PRM. It is applicable to selected reaction monitoring. Uh, for example, if you have labeled reference peptides for each endogenous peptide of interest, so uh, you can work with that. So more recently we have uh, MS that's TMT, which focuses on uh, data with T experiments with TMT uh, labeling. And we have in the works, it's not quite uh, released uh, yet, but we hope that before the end of the year, we will have a workflow for differential post-translational modifications. So what is important, we try to make uh, MS stats as versatile as uh, possible in terms of interoperability with other tools. So uh, besides being free and open source, so we have converters to a variety of uh, current uh, academic or commercial uh, software which work with raw spectra and extract identified and quantified features. So in particular, Skyline, MaxQuant, OpenMS, SpectraNode, Proteome Discover, uh, quite a few others. So for example, Skyline 
exports a report, which is directly readable into MSTAT's MaxQuant doesn't do that, but we have converters which take MaxQuant output and convert the data uh, into the MSTATS uh, format. So let's see, we have a couple of questions. Is MSTATS applicable only to SRM or for PRM? Uh, both. So uh, same data structure from uh, our side. Are all of these packages available for the new R version? Probably. So to be honest, we just haven't had a chance to uh, test it thoroughly. So it should be, but we will probably spend the next uh, two or three weeks making sure that this is the case. So there are no surprises, but it should be. Uh, so for the moment, we're using the older version of R. Um, can it be used in metabolomics? Probably, but again, we have not um, benchmarked this on metabolomic data. We would be interested in looking into this in more details. So hopefully when we um, look at the examples of data structure, you can uh, see if this is something which can be applicable to that. And we will be happy to maybe have an offline discussion about that. But uh, as of today, so it has been primarily benchmarked on proteomic data, and this has been our main uh, focus of um, applications. And uh, the same thing for uh, lipidomics. So we have not benchmarked this uh, to, the, to, to our satisfaction, but we are happy to, for example, collaborations in that, if you would like. OK. so. Um, in terms of uh, statistical analysis, so what we are aiming to offer is flexible models which account for complex designs, but also account for technological um, for technological artifacts such as missing values and outliers. And uh, an important part is making sure that parameter estimates are stable so that our inference is stable. And I will talk about this a little bit later. And as I mentioned early system suitability QC and also sample size and uh, for testing and uh, classification. So I see there are more questions uh, uh, arriving. So let me leave them for a little bit later. So hopefully I will introduce, introduce a little bit what we do and then we will, um, we will go into that. Okay. So let's see, this is an, another representation of the same thing. So how different functionalities in MS that's map to the steps of the data analysis workflow. So uh, in terms of data acquisition and data processing, we have converters uh, to all of those tools. So there's a, is MSTATS for DDA, SRM, and DIA. So this is also a separate package for MSTATS TMT. What we also realized by working uh, when developing uh, the tools is that data availability is a really important part for method development and for method evaluation. And so, is a complement to what we do in MSTAT. So we also have been working with Massive Repository and the group of Nuno Bandera in particular to make available a repository of quantitative data in Massive. So our plan is that today we will focus on this part, MSTATs and converters to these tools. And tomorrow we'll talk about MSTATs TMT and we will work, talk about the availability of public I hope that this will be of interest to you as well. And of course, take a look on your own on these functionalities as well. Okay, so uh, we have three parts uh, that uh, I would like to emphasize. So uh, just give me one second. So uh, the first part, we will talk about uh, the statistical modeling uh, behind MS stats. And I will take a particular focus from the uh, reproducibility perspective. And then I will have two more examples in terms of data processing and why data processing is important. And also how MS stats facilitates our interactions with the data processing. So, just to make sure we kind of we're clear about the input. So this is the type of data which is the input to MSTAT. So we take as input a report produced by tools such as Skyline, MaxQuant, uh, OpenMS, and so on. And so a 
type of a format that we have is a long format where each row is a feature in, for example, a CMS space. Each, each feature has a protein name, peptide sequence, a charge fragment. If it is SRM or DIA, so there's a product charge. If it has labeled references, it will be annotated with light or heavy. And the important part is the condition. So for example, here, all of these features come from condition one, and they also come from biological replicate one uh, and from run one. And then we also have the intensity on the original scale. So when Mina will uh, do the demo, she will walk you through this type of data structure uh, in a greater detail. But I think what is important there is that uh, in addition, to, so these reports can contain different type of information. And so our converters will also do filtering such as filtering um, features by quality of identification, making sure that each feature uh, has one uh, intensity uh, per run. And then we also implement normalization and log transformation. So I assume, I assume that this is all done. So Mina will talk about this in a little bit more detail. So this is how MS stats views the structure of the data for one protein. So you can think of this as an array where the columns are mass spectrometry runs and features are uh, peptides or peptide ions or uh, transitions or fragments depending on the technology uh, that you use. And again, this is not TMT, right? So it's either DIA, DDA or uh, SRM uh, for today. And so the columns represent the biological aspect of the experimental design. So here, for example, the runs came from multiple conditions. Uh, these conditions are represented by multiple subjects and maybe each subject has multiple technical replicates uh, if needed. And so this, if it's a group comparison, it means that different subjects are different in each condition. If it is a repeated measurement type of uh, design, then the same subject will be present in multiple conditions. For example, if condition is time. And so MS stats has a convention on how to annotate the sample such that we can infer from uh, essentially this data structure, we can infer what type of experiment this is and we would fit the right model to it. And so there are multiple challenges here. So how can we represent, represent this type of structure in an appropriate way? The second challenge is how to represent peak intensities because some of them can be missing, some of them can be unreliable, uh, some of them can have high, high uncertainty associated with them. So how do we deal with that? And the last challenge is how do we actually proceed with fitting the model, estimating the variance components accurately, and performing model-based uh, hypothesis testing with the understanding that we need to do it over and over and over for thousands of proteins. And so we have to kind of productionalize it and make sure that our process is stable for different circumstances, which may include you know, missing values, which may include uh, some, some other types of uncertainty. And so this is, uh, and so this is our uh, objective. So what I will do now, I will just kind of walk you through these three challenges and how we think about uh, this type of structure of the experiment. But let's see, maybe I can take um, a few questions. So what do you mean by converters? Do you mean that you can take the data from max quant and then use it on uh, MS stats? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Uh, is it possible to calculate abundance through spectral counts in MS stats? Um, not really. And the reason is that spectral counts are count data and we assume that the data are uh, peak intensities. So this is really designed for intensity data. You would need different statistical models to work with count data. Um, do we have a converter for PTM proteomic data? Um, internally, yes, but it is still under development. So we're hoping to release this uh, before the end of this year. But as of today, uh, it's not quite ready yet. Um, okay, so I will leave some other questions here. So by the way, if we run out of time, so some of these questions will be carried over uh, to the uh, Google Doc and we will be able to answer them uh, offline. Okay, so, so, so now I will talk about the three challenges and how we think about them. 
So the first uh, challenge is how to represent experimental design. And you know, if you took statistics 101, so you know that we are supposed to randomize things, right? So it is important to randomize the order of data collection, the order of storage, the order of selecting samples from the population so that we can uh, prevent uh, artifacts from systematic bias, both biological and technological. And this is true, except that in many cases, including in our case here, it is not possible to completely randomize everything. And so here's an example of a completely randomized design a uh, hypothetical completely randomized design of an LCMS experiment where we take this run and acquire the intensity of this feature and then we take this run and acquire intensity of this feature and then we go back and acquire intensity of this feature. Of course, this is something which is not possible. This is not how the data are collected. So therefore, when we think about using statistical methods that represent these data structures, we need to account for the fact that the data are not completely randomized. But what is happening is this. So the randomization only occurs at the level of the runs. So we randomize the order in which we acquire different conditions and subjects, but there is no randomization at the level of the run. So all the features are acquired together within the same run. So in statistical vocabulary, this actually has a very, um, this has a very uh, well-defined type of designs and these designs are called split plot designs. And what we do is actually based on the split plot representation of experimental designs uh, for mass spectrometry experiments. So when you do that, so there's actually very extensive statistical literature on how to analyze split plot designs. And I don't have time to really go into these details, except maybe to say that there is this big mixed effects model that you can write. So where you decompose the variation in this data in contribution of conditions. This is what we're interested in, right? This is our biology. This is why we do the experiment. These are biological replicates within each condition. So in this case, it's a group comparison design. If we have technical replicate runs, we have also a variation between runs. And so this pink terms in this model represent this pink part of the experimental design. And then there is also a yellow part, which is the technology, right? So the pink is the biology, the yellow is the technology. And so this is, so, so this is the biology, this is whole plot, and this is the technology, and this is what comes with the restriction on randomization. It is called the subplot. And so if we kind of think about the theory behind these methods, and again, it's very well known. So you can show that in a special cases when we have no missing values and we have the same number of runs and subjects for each condition and so on, our conclusions in terms of comparing conditions only depend on the summary of our feature intensities in each run. So even though we fit this really complicated model, fundamentally to compare conditions, we can summarize the runs. This is true when we have no missing values. And so what MSTATS is offering is extending this to more realistic situations when we have missing values, we have unbalanced cases and so on. So this is how we think about uh, the experimental designs. Okay, so the second, okay, let me maybe just take a few um, Question. So do we need to run blank samples between randomized runs to avoid possibility of significant uh, carryover? Uh, this is a good practice. Uh, whether you need to do it between every run or between that many runs, uh, I think it depends a little bit uh, on your setup, but generally it is definitely a good practice to eliminate carryovers. How does your structure account for sample fractions? Okay, this is really a good question. So we do work with fractions. So uh, in this case, you can say, okay, we have the first two features come from fraction one and the last second two features come from fraction two. So we essentially just uh, concatenate them. So the danger is or the difficulty is that the same feature can be present in multiple fractions. And then we need to think about how to combine this in this data structure. <clears throat> What we usually do for the moment, we do something fairly simple. We select quote unquote best fraction for this feature and just keep the intensities from this fraction and the best can be defined as highest intensity and things like that. So we don't do any fancy modeling there. We just keep one fraction for this feature, but all the features from multiple fractions, they just become part of this um, data structure. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay. Uh, is it common to use pool data as quality control? Uh, sure. But again, this is something that we do not, can, does not fit into this current uh, discussion. But uh, usually as a QC samples that you interleave between the endogenous samples, uh, this is really good practice. So I invite you to look into MSTAS QC and we have a series of publications associated with that where we discuss uh, these topics. Okay, but going back, so what we've been doing, we've been talking about these challenges, right? And so the first is represent experimental design. And so now we account for the fact that we have essentially lack of randomization on the features, but randomization on the condition subject side. So the second thing is how do we actually model uh, missing values and non-missing values, right? So how do, how do we accurately represent peak intensities given the fact that we try to work with different data processing tools? So this is an example. These are two data sets here. This is a data dependent acquisition from Jorgen Cox out of Q paper. And this is a data, data independent acquisition data set from Bruder uh, and colleagues. And so this data set is processed with three uh, tools. So Skyline, MaxQuant, and Progenesis. And this is processed with Skyline and Spectronaut. And the gray areas in these plots represent log intensities of all the features in the experiment. So across all peptide ions, all proteins, all runs, all together. So we just plot the histogram of log intensities of everything which is in this data set. And so the first thing you see is already the range of the values is not the same. You see the x-axis have the same limit. So for example, progenesis has lower values than um, max quant and skyline. Well, by itself, it doesn't matter because we're interested in relative quantification and not absolute quantification. So this is not uh, this is not that important, but what is important is the quality of the values which are reported by the tools. So for and the number, right? So for example, here Skyline reports two hundred three thousand uh, feature intensities. MaxQuant reports two twenty four thousand. Progenesis reports fifty six thousand. On the other hand, uh, Skyline reports 33 missing values and MaxQuant reports 38,000 missing values. Skyline has 1,000 zeros, uh, MaxQuant has no zeros. So clearly different tools go differently about representing uncertainty in the data. So some call, when peaks are abundant, you can quantify them fairly easily, but when peaks are close to the signal to noise level and uh, difficult to identify or difficult to quantify, different tools make different decisions about that. And so, for example, here, this bar corresponds to the number of zeros report, reported by Skyline, right? And so there are many zeros in progenesis as well. And so what we decided to do, since we want, we want to work with different converters and make this tool available and work with all of these tools, it is not really possible to take the output of these tools on the face value, we need to essentially be able to say, these peaks have some uncertainty in them versus some other peaks have a better quality, just in terms of peak area integration and uh, being able to, to quantify that. And so what we decided to do is to establish a threshold, which is specific to every data set and every data processing tool, where we say below this threshold, we don't trust the values. And we can call them small values, we can call them zeros, we can call them NA. So below this threshold, we say, okay, the values have um, low confidence. Therefore, we will look at them more carefully. And we know that most often the values have low confidence for reason of low abundance. So if uh, Occasionally, for example, Skyline distinguishes when Skyline leaves NA, it means that the peak is not low abundant, but you cannot quantify it, maybe because it overlaps with another peak very strongly, or because, for example, if you have a scheduled SRM, the peak moved outside of the scheduling window. So this will be NA. But other than that, so low value of peaks essentially mean, often indicate uncertainty for reasons of low abundance. And so therefore MSTATS will view these values below the threshold as reported by the tools and newly defined uh, as censored values. So meaning that they are missing, but they're missing informatively. So they're missing for reasons of low abundance. And we will work with that. Now, how we define this threshold, 
we'll look at what would be the right tail of this distribution because it's, we think it's more reliable to characterize that. We we'll look at the median of this distribution, look at this distance and flip this distance to the left. So it's a very kind of simple um, type of uh, threshold. And so the same thing holds true for DIE. And so now if, uh, if we do that, so some of those values become replaced with what we say is missing for reasons of censoring, but however, some missing values stay. And by the way, if a whole subject is missing, so then there's nothing to do, we just leave it as missing, right? Or the whole condition is missing, then nothing to do, we leave it as missing. Okay, and so then the next step is how do we go about uh, dealing with these uh, censored uh, values and also outliers and also other type of uncertainty in the data. Well, we go back to this experimental design presentation and we remember that conclusions for comparisons between conditions depend primarily on the summaries of runs. So now we modify our procedure by looking into two steps. The first step is ignoring the origin of each run. So from which condition it comes, from which subject it comes. And we just look at a two-way table feature versus run. And to this two-way table, we fit a model which is both robust and accounts for censoring. So in principle, there are models in statistical literature which allow us to do it simultaneously, just somehow find robust estimates of runs while accounting for censored values. We found it's not very stable in practice when we have to do it over and over for each protein. So we do two intermediate steps. We first account for censoring. We replace censored values with what we infer these values of missing or censored intensities could have been. So we impute these values. And after the imputation was summarized, all the values over features and runs. And so now we go back to the essentially pink part of our experimental design, where instead of many features, now we have one number per protein per run. And so with that, we can now focus on the nature of the experimental design and perform comparison between conditions. So let's see, I have a lot more questions than I can handle, but let me try. Uh, if you um, can you explain more about linear mixed effects model i will in a minute so hopefully it will clarify a little bit and if not we should probably uh, talk offline a little bit uh, how does the model work with multiple conditions well just the same right so we have multiple conditions here i have dot 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 and so we will need to say uh, we have many conditions each condition is represented by subjects each subject may be represented by multiple runs. So we just, so the number of conditions doesn't matter. And in fact, these conditions can be combinations of multiple treatments and this is not a problem at all. So does censored mean imputed? Not quite. So censored is a statistical term, which means that you have a value that is missing but it's not missing randomly, but it's missing with some information. So it means that it's missing, but we know it's small, right? As opposed to it's missing and we don't know what it is. And how you deal with censored values, well, there are multiple ways. So MS stats actually impute censored values, but you don't have to. So there are other alternatives ways of dealing with that. So we decided to go with the imputation primarily for reasons of computational scalability and stability. but. In general, in statistical literature, you do not have to impute to deal with censored values. Uh, why is the right tail better? So I think we are referring to this distribution because right tail is much better defined than the left tail, right? So here the left tail, there's a lot more discrepancy between the tools. Um, it is not very clear. When you look at a very small percentile, it is not clear where it ends. Uh, whereas the right tail is based on high and well-resolved peaks. So we just use this as our uh, thought process to find the left tail threshold. So essentially it, it assumes a certain symmetry of this big histogram, at least in the kind of in the center of the distribution. Um, uh, how the imputation model deals with many NA? Okay, so 
what we require for this imputation, maybe I can look here, is that in this table to do the imputation, let's say for this feature, so this feature needs to have an observed value in at least one run. And this run needs to have an observed value in at least one feature. So if you have a run where nothing is observed for this protein, you cannot impute. If you have a condition where nothing is observed for this protein, you cannot impute, right? Also, if we have missing values from Skyline, which come because Skyline said, okay, the peak was high, I just couldn't quantify it. We will not assume it's censored. We will leave it as an A. And finally, if you work with label-based experiments where you have labeled reference peptides, so we do assume that the labeled references, they have high enough abundance and so they cannot be missing for reason of low abundance. So we will not impute uh, labeled references either. So you do imputation in very specific cases where you actually have enough information in terms of what is the overall level of the run and what is the overall level of the feature in order to do the imputation. So how did we impute the values? So just once again, so we, have, we fit this model where you have run and feature. And this model has, uh, so it's called the accelerated failure time model. So it essentially specifies a likelihood function, which for the observed data says, okay, we observe the data, but for censored values, we say the data is somewhere below the threshold, we don't know where. So these are fairly standard statistical techniques. And by the way, we leveraged standard implementations for the AFT model in R, we did not invent our own implementation for that. Um, again, what is difference between censored and NA? So once again, censored means that it's missing for reason of low abundance and NA means that it is missing randomly, not for reason of low abundance. Okay, and so the last uh, challenge uh, that we have here is uh, parameter estimation. And so this is something which is also important because even if we don't need to impute and even if we don't have the outliers, turns out that this two-step summarization where we first summarize and then perform statistical modeling is actually beneficial also for reasons of parameter estimates. And so, in balanced cases, we can do it in two ways. We can use analysis of variance type of estimation of variance components, which is great because it's unbiased and it's usually what is viewed as a gold standard. In practice, we cannot do that because we have many proteins with missing values and unbalanced design. So we use an approach called restricted maximum likelihood to estimate parameter, the parameters. And so what we show here is in this particular example, this is one protein from two conditions. It's a time course experiment. This is a good case, but we see that if the model is more complicated, the degrees of freedom of pairwise comparisons are a little bit strange, right? And this just is a side effect of having this restricted maximum likelihood parameter estimation. But then in other cases, it can be worse. So here, for example, when the model is more complicated, we can have negative variance components, which affect the degrees of freedom and affect the inference, but doing this in two steps results in a much more stable uh, inference procedure. And in real life cases, when we have some missing values, so if we start to fit these complex models, the estimates of fall change, the estimates of standard errors, everything becomes uh, compromised. And so I would like to argue that this is another reason for having a, a two-step uh, summarization and estimation approach. But what is interesting is that this process is motivated not just because we think it's a good thing to do, but because there's a statistical theory behind that. And the reason why it's good to have a statistical theory, it's because we can now understand how to extend this to other types of experiments, such as controlled mixtures or experiments with labeled references or experiments with TMT labeling and so on. So this allows us to create a framework which can really be very versatile and work with different types of experimental design. So some examples now. Um, okay, so um, can you analyze data in MS stats without imputation? Yes, you don't have to use imputation. Oh, very important. Is feature representing a peptide or a protein? So this is really important for understanding uh, what we do. So let me go back. So a feature, so this data structure is one protein. So if we have thousand 
proteins, we have thousand data structures like that. So each protein is represented by whatever is quantified in this experiment. So if it's a DDA experiment, it's a peptide ion, right? So it's a combination of peptide and charge. If it's SRM, a feature is a transition. So if you have two peptides and three transitions per peptide, you have six features and they're all going into here, right? Same thing for DIA, right? If you have two peptides and three fragments per peptide, you have six features. And we do it over and over for every protein. So if we have 10,000 proteins, we fit 10,000 models like that. So that's uh, what's going on. Uh, why the log intensity accumulation figures look like normally distributed? Is it always the case? Well, uh, the data on the original scale are usually uh, multiplicative meaning, and this is why we're interested in fold changes, right? So one condition increases the abundance of a protein, twofold, threefold, and so on. So this, when we look at the ratios, it means it's multiplicative. So taking the log has two benefits. One is that we replace multiplicative properties of the data with additive properties. And additive properties are much easier to deal with in statistics because the probability distributions of sums of variables are much easier to characterize than ratios. And also the variance on the original scale is much, very much a function of the intensity, right? So high abundant analytes are more variable. So the log transformation mitigates this somewhat. So on the log scale, it kind of tends to be the opposite. Low intensity features are more variable, high intensity features are less uh, variable. So is it exactly normal? No. Uh, is it better than original scale? Uh, for sure. And so a lot of the assumptions that we make are approximate, but let me add one more thing, and this maybe adds a little, answers a little bit of question of another person. So an important assumption that we make in this type of models is not that just the data are normal, but the measurements are independent. And this is something which is really important. And so I would say that violations of dependence are much more problematic than violations of normality. And so a lot of work is done on one hand by experimental design to make sure that we can assume that there is no batch effects or contaminations and so on that violate independence. And on the other hand, represent the systematic patterns in the data to enough satisfaction that what is left over the unexplained variation can be viewed as uh, independent and non-systematic. Okay, so let me give some examples. I want to make sure that Mina has time for demo. So now I'll just uh, go fairly quickly. So this is a data set that Mina will use. So this is a IPRG data set. So this was a data set from a study by the Association of Biomedical Resource Facilities, which made available a data set to its community to compare how well people go about uh, detecting differential abundant proteins. So there was a yeast uh, background, and then there were these proteins spiked into samples in different concentrations. So label-free DDA in Orbitrap uh, and processed with Skyline. So uh, Brandon McLean was also involved very much um, in this project. And so these are just a few examples. So here is, this, this figure illustrates specifically the summarization. So here's the protein, um, it's a background protein. So the light gray lines, these are the features of the protein. And then the colored lines, these are different summaries. So the green line is a common thing to do where we take the sum of the feature intensities on the original scale and then take a log uh, transformation. So the summary is obviously above all of the individual features because it's the sum. Then the yellow line, this is the big model that I mentioned before, right? Then the red squares, this is uh, to commit and polish, this is just using robust summary accounting for outliers, but not for censoring. And then the dark red is MS stat, so it's using imputation summarization and so on. And the point is that all of these models do the same here, right? And you have the full change, very similar, the p-value, so the protein is not supposed to change. In other words, when the data are clear, you can do pretty much any, you can use any reasonable procedure and you will do fine. So, so these are all equally reasonable ways of doing that. However, if you start having interferences, for example, here you have an outlier among low intensity features. And so now you see that the linear model is kind of having a bit of a harder time. The true fault changes one, it gives 
uh, log of sum is not affected because the interference is in the low intensity feature and it doesn't affect the sum very much. Uh, here's a situation when we have an interference in high intensity feature. So suddenly log of the sum is not doing very well because it's a high intensity feature affects uh, the summary. And this is kind of very common, right? When we have a little bit of everything and if we just use the big linear model, it has all manners of difficulties, log of sum underestimates the true fall change of 7.5 and you need both robust methods and recognizing that these values are unreliable and replace them with censoring this blue line. This is our censoring threshold. So we say that below this line, values are unreliable. And so it gets closer to the true fall change here. So, um, a question I can maybe answer quickly. How protein inference peptide to protein step changes your summarization? Um, we take as input the data as reported by data processing tool. So whatever the data processing tool, including the identification steps and so on, maps features to the protein, we just take it as a face value. So the only thing that we do in the converters, we may have some values missing based on the Q value threshold and Mina will talk about this in more uh, details. Okay, so, but going back to reproducibility and this is why we started this whole conversation, right? So how can we now make sure that our results are actually less dependent on data processing tools? Remember in the very beginning, I was saying that we want to have the data, that our conclusions depend you know on the biology in our experiment and less dependent on our choices of which data processing tools we used and which choices these tools um, made and so here are three data sets the first one is one i just showed the iprg data set and the other two are two additional controlled mixtures so these are the data sets where we know the truth we know which proteins are changing in abundance and this just highlight the summarization so this column summarizes the proteins by taking sum and then the log. And this one is summarizing the data with MSTATS. And so each set is processed with three and here with four data processing tools. And we see that if we don't take the data at the face value, but we put a little bit more thought into the modeling, the overlap between the tools in terms of which true proteins were reported as differentially abundant is actually uh, much higher. So, uh, and we have a collection of other data sets. So in fact, here we have DIA uh, experiments, also three controlled mixtures and same thing, right? So here we have four data processing tools and we see that the overall increases if we do the modeling. And let me also clarify that the, after we summarize the, the imputation, the models in both cases are the same. So this really highlights the value of uh, imputation and robust summarization. So this was the first part. And so now I have 10 minutes left and I will just uh, showcase a little bit how else we can contribute to reproducibility. So the first part here uh, talks about the fact that MSTATS cannot solve all the problems. And so even though we're doing our best, uh, this will definitely matter. And then the second part will talk about how we can help despite that. And so let's see. So this is a second data set which uh, Brandon used in the second day of his presentation and Mina will also use uh, in her uh, demo. So this was a data set from Selasec et al. So this is one of the earlier days DIA uh, SWAS uh, data set. It's a time course experiment, so six time points. Uh, and it was yeast samples in response to osmotic stress. Uh, 18 DIA runs total. What was interesting about this experiment is that in addition to just profiling the samples with DIA as per the usual, uh, the experimenters did an additional uh, study where they took one uh, condition and they ran the same sample over and over for eight times just to understand how well each particular fragment can be quantified. So one sample, just do it eight times in a row. And then they took note of at which peptide precursors were detected in more than half of these runs. They called them refinement runs. And which of them had coefficients of variation less than 20%. 
And so then we had two analyses. So one is just analyze everything that we see. And the other is only analyze fragments which have good properties. So essentially this was an attempt to bring the analysis more into kind of targeted, you know, uh, workflow as opposed to global discovery workflow. And what was also done in addition, we looked at this with Skyline in these two ways. And then the data were also analyzed with Spectronaut and uh, DI Empire and everything else. We had the Q value filter and uh, MS stats workflow after that. So let's take a look. So this is what happens when we analyze the data with Skyline with everything. And this is what happens when we analyze the data with uh, low CV. And so clearly if we remove some of the fragments which have poor quantitative properties, we lose proteins. So we lost 4, 000, oh, 400 proteins here. And it may be thought of as a bad thing because we lost some proteins. At the same time, among the proteins that remain, we can see that if we look at comparisons of different time points to time point zero, so it jumps up even more up, then goes down again up. So this looks like a little bit of a CISO pattern, which is less plausible biologically. But here we have a more moderate increase in proteins, which are differentially abundant even more so. And so this more kind of moderate but steady pattern of activation in response to stress is more plausible biologically. So we don't know the truth. We don't know which proteins are differentially abundant for real, but I would say that this is probably more trustworthy. So for this particular time point, this is the overlap between analyzing everything versus analyzing uh, data with low CV only. And this is one protein. This is the example. So clearly some of those noisy fragments were filtered out. And so we have just one outlier left here. And this is the outlier that MS stats can handle very easily. And so, for this particular case, no changes in uh, conclusions. But uh, in this other case, we see that analyzing everything versus low CV actually resulted in a different conclusion. So this actually matters. And so now if we look at the same data with different data processing tools, we see that data processing tools, of course, are very important. So this is the Skyline low CV. This was Spectronaut with everything. Day Empire, I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, DI Empire is not designed for the mass uh, resolution of this instrument. So DI Empire performs better than that. So this is not fair, necessarily fair comparison to DI Empire. And so what we see is that if we look at the time profile of one particular protein here, we see that with low CV, we have a steady progression. And with the other tools, it can be kind of quite variable, but now the red line here, this is the line corresponding to MS stats. And we see that MS stats can mitigate this noise to uh, some extent. Okay, and so uh, here, by the way, so because it's a known stress, there was a known pathway, which, was, which is known to be activated uh, in response to this stress. And so we were looking at the overlap of our conclusions with the pathway with MS stats versus log sum. And we see that we have a higher overlap if we analyze the data with MS stats. And so the very last part, I want to also wanted to highlight uh, what can we do about that? So essentially the conclusion here was that data processing matters, right? So if we have cleaner data, we do better. And MS stats can account for some of this variation, but it cannot do miracles, right? If we have very noisy data, it's still difficult. And so the question that we asked ourselves was, well, if we go between all data and low CV data, we went from here to here by doing more experiments. Right, and so understanding experimentally what were the CVs, what was a good quality measurements. And so can we somehow distinguish poor quality measurements from good quality measurements data computationally, just based on the profile of these features without necessarily doing those eight refinement runs. And so this is what we set out to do. And this was the work um, by uh, Brendan, Mina, and Sung Heng. So this is going back to the CELFSEC data set. And we said, okay, what are the options for us to process this? So we can use all the data, all the precursors, and only remove features which Q value do not pass a threshold. We can use all precursors, six fragments. And if more than half of the features, half of the runs of a feature do not pass the, uh, the Q value cutoff, eliminate the entire feature. 
And now let's use the refinement run, only eliminate individual measurements, or the refinement run and eliminate the entire features if we eliminate too many measurements of this feature. And so this is what these things look like. So clearly the profiles look very differently if we do that. So again, if we keep filtering, we lose proteins. So it may look like a bad uh, thing. And so Tsung Heng Tsai, a uh, former postdoc and now faculty at Kent State University um, in our group, developed a procedure which essentially establishes what does it mean for a feature to have too many missing values? What does it mean for a protein to have a particular consensus profile? What does it mean for an individual measurement to be an outlier? And what does it mean for a feature to be very noisy? And so we establish the cutoffs based on the full collection of data based on that. And then we can do the filtering in a manner similar to what we would have done with the refinement runs. And so here's a conclusion. So this is for the same CELFSEC data set. So these are different processing that we tried on this data. And this is the agreement in terms of differentially abundant proteins with different processing if we don't do this filtering. And now we try this different processing and we do this computational post hoc filtering. And we see that if we do not use the refinement runs, but if we use computational filtering of noisy features, then our conclusions depend less on which options we chose to select the features. And so this is very important because now it means that the upstream choices of which Q value cutoff to use, do we use refinement run or not? Do we leave individual missing values or do we remove the entire features? Well, we're still dependent on that, but we're dependent on that less than if we just go uh, with the features uh, as input. So I will finish here to make sure that Mina has enough time uh, to speak. So just to come back to this reproducibility. So I hope I illustrated to some extent at least how on one hand using open source documentable software allows us to redo the analysis many times as needed, but also how our conclusions are less dependent on the data processing tools, but also on the parameters and choices which we have to make in order to work uh, with the data processing tools. And I didn't have time to talk about this, but I hope you can look at the papers that we have in our lab and look especially at the assay characterization and MSTAS QC, which is the part of uh, system suitability. And so the last part is I want to make sure that I acknowledge many of the group members and collaborators who have contributed. And this work would not be possible without collaborators with experimentalists who generate the data, but also with the developers of the tools. And actually, I would like to take a minute to acknowledge specifically the developers of Skyline and developers of Spectronaut and developers of OpenMS and many other tools which, with whom we work very closely uh, to make sure that we understand the, their data appropriately. And we also give them feedback. Sometimes it happened to us that our feedback helped them improve uh, their tools as well. So we very much appreciate that. So let me see if I can answer maybe a few questions and then um, uh, we, will, um, uh, we will go on to the demo. So when does multiple testing happen? Uh, multiple testing happens after we have p-values. So every time when you have more than one p-value, you need to account for the fact that you have many p-values. So once you report a p-value, if you have 10,000 proteins, you have 10,000 tests. And so we use Benjamin Hochberg adjustment for multiple testing, again, primarily for reasons of computational stability. We think that this is a good balance between sensitivity and stability uh, of the results. Um, let's see, a lot of things are very technical. Uh, So I guess, you know what, let us move on to the demo and maybe I can answer some of these questions uh, in typing at the same time. Right, and then also I can see many the technical question. I'll, maybe I, if I can answer many questions during the demo and if I can cover, I will answer it later. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. So hello everyone, I'm Mina Choi. I'm a main developer for MSDAT. So before we start, I uh, will just go over uh, where you can find all the material, what, and then where you can download the data set, and then um, 
and, and so on. So here, I think everyone knows this our website. So here you can see here is the document and then the previous of uh, the lecture, we already make a video. If you click it, you can see the recorded video on the YouTube. So, okay, here is the today's one. So if you click this doc, I will show the Google doc here. So now this one is locked. So only the speaker can uh, write here. So if you have a question, please put uh, your question uh, in the Q and A on the webinar. Uh, we will copy to the, this document. So here you can download a slide uh, from for the, the August presentation. And then here, if you click this one, you can see the instruction, how you download the R and R Studio, and then how you install the, the MS Dev package. And then if you click this button, we will go to the our Google Drive. So here you can see if you click data, you can see all the data. So you can download all this um, the folders over there. And also, if you click this material, this is the whole um, description. So what we probably we cannot cover this at all. This is for pretty much two and a half day courses. So I will point. I will um, talk about the most important part to for MS that. But here you can follow the later. And then also here, there are a useful link. This is the Mesocont. Uh, probably I will shortly mention at the end of the, um, the this uh, tutorial, or tomorrow we're gonna cover this one um, more. And then there's also a link um, for May Institute 2019 for two and a half days. We pretty much cover and repeat the many data set for MSDAT and MSDAT TMT and then also classification. So you can also watch this uh, one. So I download, you, you should download, uh, if you want to follow it, uh, you download this data set and um, just save somewhere in your computer. So for example here, so now we have a uh, data folders. So today I will just show you IPRG um, data set by Skyline. So start our studio. So, okay, before we start, I will focus on a more new MS user and then kind of beginner. Uh, if you are advanced or intermediate and then have a more uh, detailed question, please uh, put the question and answer. After I go through the, all the demo for one specific data set, I will try to go over, over it. Okay, so here is the folder. I will go to the um, DDA IPRG, the Skyline. I put the R script and input and just in case I just put the old output there, but you don't need to, it will gonna generate it. So I just open this, uh, the R script and then here's how it look like. So first you have to load. the MS that so now if you question and MS that show uh, the brief description about the what MS they're doing. So mainly MS that is developed for protein significant analysis in DDA and SRM DIA. I remember one of the question about, uh, okay, I'll before I will go, I will answer some questions. So for TMT, the ISO label, isobatic the labeling strategy, we have a MS that TMT, which we will cover tomorrow. Uh, the question is uh, the side leg is supported. Also, uh, if you say side leg is general side leg, which means if you have a one run or one group completely just control like uh, SRM with the heavy labeled the peptide, that works. If not, if you mean two groups, two different labeling, and then want to compare, um, generally we cannot cover it. So if you if you really want to use this, we have to more customize um, data manipulation before that. 
uh, for MSDF for tomahawk quanti quantitation, I think this is a multi plus one. I think this one is more related to the MSDF TMT. We haven't tried that one yet. Uh, if you are interested, in, um, just you can contact us. And also um, the QC part, um, that one is more the um, MSDF QC package can handle this. So that one is also can be the another solution one. Okay, and then the, um, okay. So first, if you go there, here's input. So we have a, one is a report, which is a report from Skyline. The Skyline have an option to report unless that uh, the required format. If you click that one, you can automatically uh, generate this uh, report for the MSDEF. Uh, and then here's the annotation. So um, we, we need the two, two input. One is the quantification report from any data processing tools. Second one is annotation. If you click it, this is the metadata. So maybe that will be easy to, I will show the Excel format. So most likely the data processing tool, they have a quantification for each one um, uh, for all the proteins or features or peptide. So we, for statistical analysis for high process testing between group or something, we actually need annotations. So which means this each, the runs came from which samples, the, and each sample came from which condition and then from which biological replicate. So for example, this run, this one for sample from condition one and then the biological replicate one. And then the second run, this one from the condition two and then this one came from the biological replicate two and then so on. So this one actually we need uh, the your input and then how you define that this information also can be affected, you know, statistical analysis. So if you ready, if you are ready for this too, um, the input, you can run it. So here we just use the read CSV functions. So I will run this, oh, oh before that I need to set it up though, um, the where's the working directory. So we have to tell the R uh, where's all the files there. So here, if you click more and then click set the working directory. Okay, they always always start from the, this working directory. Okay, from this working directory, okay, so read this report. Then here you can see there are small stop button means R is running. Um, if you still can see this one they are running is so you can see uh, they are reading the, the quantifications. So I will come back how you make an annotation. This one can answer the, about the fractionation and technical replicate information. Yeah, it will take a little bit while. So I will, I will talk um, about this annotation probably first. So this annotation, how you set up the annotation is quite the key part. So MSDAT, the, one of the advantage for MSDAT is we actually recognize experiment design automatically. So if you just tell us your annotation, you don't need to worry about the experiment design. And then based on the, what we are recognized, um, um, we are gonna find the best model for your experiment. And then we select the best um, statistical models. So for example, we cover the three types of uh, experiment design. One is we call group comparison, which means we just want to compare two different conditions. So very, the simple case is a healthy group versus um, the disease groups. So in that case, we assume the healthy, healthy persons never be the, the cancer patients. So um, for example, um, we have a three uh, individuals, three persons, and then we have a three lung cancer patients. And then we just take the one sample per each person, and then it will be one tube, one sample. In that case, we have a one run 
And then this one came from healthy group. And then the, the person number one. And the second one is, so we also have a sample and run four. And that one is came from the healthy um, group. And then this person's ID is so number two and so on. And then for the you know, cancer group, we have also a unique run. This one came from the cancer group. But the, this, um, the, the, this patient, the person's the subject ID is four. So here you can see healthy group, their ID for biological replicates, so subject ID is one, two, three, but cancers, they have a four, five, six. So if, if we, this one, so the biological replicate ID cannot overlap between the healthy groups versus cancers uh, groups. So based on this information, you can write the annotation file like this. So for example, here, run one, it, this one came from condition healthy and then biological replicate one and run two came from the cancel group and then this subject ID is a six. So you can see the run one, two, three, four, five, they are unique ID and then biological replicate ID also not overlapping each other. So everything is unique. The other condition is time course design, which means we have, a, let's say we have a three peoples and then maybe we measure those, you know, we take the blood sample multiple times, different time point. For example, time point one, we take the sample from the individual person one. And then for time point two, we also take another blood sample again. And then for time three, we also take another blood sample and then also repeat for other three. So, and then for one, two, three, now in this case, a three time point, three individual, there are nine total nine samples. And then we randomize the order. So one is not one, two, three, one, two, three, four is a randomized order. In the cases, how it will be, the annotation will be is, okay, for each one, we have, a, for example, here, each one, 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 this one came from time point one from the biological replicate one, individual one. And then for one six, uh, this one for the sample one, and then time point two. But now you can see there are total nine, but here you can see, they have only three unique biological replicate. And then for each uh, biological replicate, they have a different uh, condition one. So if means if we have a unique, the biological uh, replicate, if they have a different condition, we think this is time courses, or this is also same as the pair design. So instead of the time, if you change uh, some, for example, different tissue, so for example, for one individual person, we take the tissue from healthy tissues and another healthy tissue and then cancer tissues. We actually, these samples came from the same persons. However, they actually from the different condition. In the cases, you know, statistical design wise, this is the same. So how you annotate this condition and this replicate is the key part. We recognized um, the uh, experiment design. So, uh, let's go back to the, our q and I think we, I answered some of the questions. So some people um, ask how you can pair. So if you are paired, you have to make a same biological replicate and then you have to annotate a different condition information. If you have a fraction, fraction, you have to add a fraction column. So, so for example, Run one, it should be fraction one. Run two is, let's say two, three, and one, two, three. Let, at this moment, let's ignore this one. Uh, if you see this one and this one, if you look at the only run and um, fractions, so they, how the MS that recognize this one. Okay, this run, there are three run and fractionation three means they actually came from one tube, one sample, but they fractionate three. And then for this one is also another unique, oh, definitely we have to look at the also matching the biological replicate too. Um, then 
we actually normalize and aggregate and then checking everything based on this fractionation information. Okay, so another thing is if you don't have a fractionation, if you don't have a fractionation, but if you have a multiple run, um, if you have a multiple run for one sp a specific sample, so let's say, um, um, so now let's just see only this two one. So here I have a one, two, and then three and four, let's say, and then here's time one. And replicate one, and then this one is a time point three, and then two. So let's remove this one. If you look at this, for example, here, we have a, a time point one and replicate one, time point one and replicate one. Based on these two combinations, we recognize this is the biological replicate. And then, but they have a multiple one. If we don't have a fraction column, we recognize this is the technical replicate. So just multiple injection from the same samples. So this one, if fraction, but one and two, and then fraction one and two. Okay, so then this is not a you know, technical replicate, just one sample, but they are fractionated. So based on this annotation, we actually recognize all the design automatically. And then we just um, uh, find the best um, the design. So I will, okay, so now this one is done, but I will just double check uh, if you have any question about this annotation part. Um, so I think I answer about the question of fractionation data. So can we combine the group comparison with the time course? Um, yes, it is. So yes, it is. So if you, yeah, so if you, yeah. So based on this um, structure, we can recognize and then make, we can find the best model for this. For time course, should we randomize run ahead of time then meaning classical time necessary. So for time courses, we also, you know, we assume every, every sample is corrected and then we randomize everything based on the, you know, you know, time courses and their fractionation, everything, everything. That is kind of the, our randomization uh, concepts. Um, okay. Uh, Right, the fractionation setup is uh, very confusing. It can be confusing. It can be confusing. So if you have a very specific cases, um, you can just um, um, you can uh, you can just email us, and then we can just uh, do. Or I can answer some demo in the our Google Doc over here. All right. So we read the uh, skyline. So let's see how it looks like. So first. Uh, I always, you know, very easy to just read it, but just in case I always check the our, uh, how the data look like. So for example, this is how it look like the Skyline report. So they report protein name, peptide sequence, peptide modified sequence, precursor charge, M over G, uh, fragment ion. And then here at this moment, they have, uh, I, we don't have a condition and biological replicate yet. The file name is run, the area is a peak area. Uh, and then uh, this is quite specific for the skyline. The other tools did not provide this information. Uh, so uh, the truncated means the skyline actually have uh, some um, part that recognize this peak is truncated or not. So we expect the peak should be really um, the normal distribution shape and then just pick, uh, calculate all the peak area. However, somehow some calculation is wrong or not detected wrong, correctly this range. They actually cut some part of the peak and then just calculate this one. In that cases, we cannot trust their peak of uh, the value itself. Um, and then the Skyburn report that this is a truncated or not. So if that is a truncated, 
we just ignore the reported uh, peak area and then we just um, um, treated this just a random missing. Um, so here, um, then how it looked like uh, here, they have uh, more than 3000 proteins are there. And then here also calculate the, uh, the unique the fragment ion. This is a DDA cases. Um, they uh, the skyline report the fragment ion uh, like this way. If data have uh, some issue, you can see something more in the cases that you also handled. Um, uh, we also need to extract the data manipulation one. So here's the line 19 show uh, the file name, which means uh, unique run. So in the cases for IPRG data, we have a uh, 12 runs. So one to 12, you can see it. If something happened for processing tool, like some typo or something, maybe you can see less than 12 or more than 12, then we, have, we actually need to check it and then go back to the processing tools. Okay, so truncated column is a unique for skyline. So it shows the truncated, they have a true or false. So true means truncated this is not good peak. And then this line shows, so how many truncated peaks there? So this, this number of um, the you know, peak is okay, but there are 829 peaks is true, which means we are not gonna use this. So then um, I already made annotation file. So in this step, I just read the annotation. Uh, and then how it look like? Okay, here we go. So for each run, we assign the condition and then biological replica. So in specific for this uh, design, this is a spike in data set. We make a four different sample and then just uh, repeat uh, three times. So that's why we have a um, always condition one, have a uh, one biological replicate and then one here and here. We have a three run and then condition two, we have only one unique. Condition two, always a biological replicate is two. And then we have a three run and then so on. So, uh, so Sometimes if we just make a different annotation, I went at the when I just tried to this data for the first time, I just made a mistake because it's really simple type of things. For example, here this is the underbar, and then this one is just the hyphen, and then most likely underbar, and then this is the hyphen things. So this uh, one is really hard to detect the you know MS that MSD, like because we are more focused on the statistic and then we completely trust the whatever input it is. So we actually, I always recommend to double check that your annotation is correct and then they are correctly matched or not. If um, the run information from the uh, skyline and then annotation um, is not matching, we cannot recognize everything and then probably we will lose, we will lose some of the run information. Okay. So, and then here's the first step for what we call the converter. So we, so converter means technically we just uh, read, um, what, just read output from any processing tools. And then just this converter just read, already know what kind of the columns the processing to report, and then just use the useful information and then make a nice format. Um, the nice format means uh, we just are filtering some of the you know, low quality, the features, uh, and then just checking the protein in ID and then so on. So we support, I think it's a seven, seven, and eight, seven or eight. So Skyline, MaxQuant, Progenesis, uh, Protein Discoverer, OpenMS, uh, Spectronaut, and then DI Empire, and then OpenSource. So this one is uh, what we are doing. So if you want to see, okay, here's not many options. So here we just put the hour, what is the input for quantification? What is the um, input for annotation? But they actually have a more um, the options. So always question mark and then function name show the more detail what actually this each functions so supported. So for example here, um, they already already have a hidden the option. So for example, the remove IRT is a true or false, or we can filter with the Q value. This is a specific for DIA one. If they report a Q value, we can filter the true or false. And then here we use the unique the peptide true 
or false. And then we just removed some um, the features with the few measurements. So we said to remove. And then removed oxidation and peptide. Now it's a false. And then remove the protein with the one feature. So this is a default is false, but we just say true means we want to remove the protein with only one feature. So this also, here's also this description. So this is one of the example for scar line. But if you want to see other processing, so definitely you can do this. So question mark, max quant, uh, MS death format. And then here's, so something is the same, something is different. The different means that we just customized um, the, our function for that specific to, uh, the tools. So for example, here we also have the summarize the multiple roles. So Skyline already handled inside of it, so we don't need to, but here we, if they report the multiple measurement, uh, we, just, how, we just tell how we can handle this. And then protein ID is a protein or the radiator protein, you can just change this. So this is about the, uh, the converter functions. So I think I can answer um, some of the questions also related to converters. So with which version of masquant or proton discover does work uh, MSD? So masquant for 1.4, the proton discover also from 1.4. Um, so we up to now, we try to customize, you know, adapt all the, you know, whatever their changes, but it, it works. If we, something not work, please report to us. Um, so big part of the area is annotation peptide as feature and misarrange for peptide annotation. Yes, it can happen. Uh, but you know, for uh, MS that um, just assume that everything is correctly annotated, we are not checking the annotation or something. But one of the kind of the solution is what the Olga briefly mentioned of the feature selections. If you know peptide annotated differently, maybe they have a different behave differently. The feature um, selection um, algorithm can handle some of the, this one, but also have uh, some um, risky part because we are not sure this is because the misassignment or actually this specific peptide behave differently, which is maybe quite interesting for biological study. So yeah, that is a kind of the options. Um, imputation, we'll cover this one. Uh, DIA part, yes. So yes, so DIA part, DIA commonly we have a really big data set, especially the pro, um, spectral not output is really, really bigger than other data set. And then yes, so for our control, the, our testing data is up to like the 45 run cases actually working well for up to like several thousands proteins. Um, however, we also report that some of them have a problem for these REM issues. Um, we are aware of this one. And then now uh, internally MS that team is really refactoring the MS that package especially this is one of the big reasons we want to make uh, more RAM efficient and then speed, speed up for like this bigger data set. So hopefully we can make this one for next release, which means um, this October. Um, so feature selection part, I will, I will briefly mention about the next functions. This one is uh, available from, I think so from, 3.16. So yeah, it, it actually happened in this one year. So yeah, you can use it right now. So for progenesis one, one can filter out the peptide, the common peptide, yes, this is working. Uh, if you check the you know, progenesis um, format one, you can see here unipeptide, the true false option, you can decide this one. Um, so can um, MS then read the general wide or long format table with the only peptide modification sequence area for each run? So generally, okay, so um, the, in the August, uh, the slide we show the what is the, our required format. 
So this one generally works, but you need to actually need to make a little bit um, uh, the data manipulation. For example, if you don't have a you know fresh uh, fragment ion, you can just make a call and then just put any in any in any in everywhere. Um, and then for example, ISO isotope label type we cover light or heavy. In that case, you can just put the light on it and then so on. So definitely it, it can work. If you have a more question, have an issue for you know this um, for your data, just you can contact us. So, um, okay, so biological protein level summarization we can cover a little bit later. Okay, so I already mentioned we all cover like up to eight um, the processing tools. I know you guys have a, a, also a lot of the, you know data processing tools, and they also report the quantification one, and then or you guys have a, uh, the in-house um, the software where you can cover it. So if so, basically we our how we are handled is if we heard a lot of the request, uh, we actually start to look at it and then just make our converter one, or the it's more faster way is if you can look at. The, you know our you know, our MS that code is also available. You can see the GitHub over there, and then every the converter try to be very similar stuff, and uh, you can just follow it, and then you can just make uh, some draft of the um the your converter, and then we can actually can confirm this one. So definitely we need to have a more information for data processing step. But if you really want to do this, you can also contact us. Okay, so import the data, Q value cutoff and default true. What does the Q value means? This is um, this is only for the DI, DIA cases, which uh, they report the processing tool report based on their FDR. So some tool just call this the M score, some people, some other tools is a Q score or something else. This is really specific. So, so how they are calculated is really the tool specific um, the algorithms. Okay, so we have a 30 minutes one and then we haven't started to the first function is so okay so if we start to this converter let's see they are running and then they just show the what actually the converters are doing so first they just remove the you know decoy um, uh, and, and so on. Right, so they just remove the peptide that are used more than one peptide are re removed. This means we use the unipeptide, unipeptide. And then truncated pigs are replaced with NA. So I will just talk uh, one more about the missing value in the, our data processing step. Um, so briefly, uh, yeah, briefly Olga mentioned about this missing value NA sensor. Um, but we are actually very careful about this one because the different tool report the missing value differently. And then they also have a different algorithm. Um, yeah, so I will talk about in the data processing step. Okay, so here they say for DDA data set, so they uh, MS they recognize this is a DDA uh, from the um, skyline. And then they have a three isotope P, so we just sum up this. And then just report the four feature have all NA or zero intensity in the cases to just remove it. And then we also have a default option. Uh, so if feature have feature have only one or two, the measurement across the all the one, we just remove it because this is not that much informative and then also have a lot of issue for our, you know, the downstream uh, statistical models. And then we also remove the protein has one feature. So, so all protein have uh, at least uh, two features. Okay, then the input data, input skyline is, is the some the, um, the cleaned, the required MS form over there. So, and then I just double check. So the, we have a right number of runs. So here one to so 12 one we have. Before we move on, I just always double check the preliminary pre checks. So for example, here. So how many proteins are left? So here we have a 1327. I think the previously we have a much more 1390, 
Yeah, 1397. So almost 70 um, proteins are removed for some reason. I guess most of them probably have a more, many missing value and so on. So, and then here, this one should count how many NA value for intensity. So let's check. So there are NA values of two, 219. And then the next one is count how many zero value, not NA value and the zero value, how many they have. So they have a 2014, um, this one. So Skyline also very unique to report two different um, missing values, so zero and NA. Um, so the NA is basically most likely from the truncated peak. We just think this is random. So we are not sure, we cannot impute it this one. And zero means really small value. So really small value. So if they have a like really like point zero point something, something, we just replace this zero or actually they report this is the zero, which means we assume this is really low abundance. Um, the peak in the cases, we actually want to impute it, this one. So this is a very specific for Skyline. However, however, most of the tool just is, uh, choose one of this. So MaxQuant report the missing value NA, the progenesis uh, report the missing value zero. And I cannot remember the other older tool, but they actually report the missing value differently. And then also most likely there's no information which one is a random missing in the low intensity missing and so on. So we are really um, care about how we handle this missing values. So, and after I just clean up, I just save it in the output folders. And then this is the main function. So uh, MS they start and they use the converter. And then we have a two main functions left. One is the data processing, and the next step is group comparisons. So data processing doing pretty much everything except the really high processing testing part. So first, what they are doing is read the data, and then also checking if they have any kind of the missing information and so on, and then automatically recognized of design of experiment. If they have uh, some issues, they're gonna report it. And if they have uh, some issue to report, to recognize it, they just report you, you missing this information, please give this information and so on. First of what they are doing is they, um, the, the MS that uh, uh, log to transformation for peak intensity. And then we do the normalization. So normalization means uh, just remove some systematic the variation across the runs. Uh, we have uh, four options. Uh, if you are wondering what kind of option for normalization, you can also find um, some information here. So equalize the median means we make the e, um, equalize the median of peak intensity per run. So which means it did also have a big assumption that most likely most of protein, um, most of protein are not different, not different occurred between the, um, the conditions. And then here we support, we said the, what kind of summarization method you want to force um, the run level, how you summarized the feature to the group is we use the two key medium policy method. And then here, and the um, model-based imputation, so AFT model, AFT model-based imputation is true. So which means we are gonna impute it. So one of the question is, I don't wanna impute it. You can just replace this one is false. And then here you have to say, so what kind of the missing value we have imported? We have to assume that zero is um, the sensor missing or NA is the sensor missing. For Skyline, we have to say the zero is a sensor missing. So we have to uh, impute these zero values. And then this one is also about the how you use uh, um, for this one is also a parameter for the you know, AFD model one. Uh, we assume somehow the cutoff for sensor is the minimum of the features. Um, and then here, how you um, calculate the sensor, the maximum quantile is 0.999. So if you remember the slide of the OGA show for each data set, so it should be the whole data set. We just check the distribution of log to intensity and then check the 90, like 
what percentage of off. So here's 99.9 .9 percentile. And then just calculate the distance between median to this, and then subtract the dist distance from the median. And then we think that under the there, uh, we think this is the sensor missing and then imputed. So if you have a, want to check the more option, so you can check the question data process. So here, here is the whole whole options how you can you can check it. So this one uh, is um, it, this is more time consuming part. So I will just run this one, and then I will go back um, to the question and answer. Uh, but when she here, so they just check that there are uh, this much intensity with the uh, zero or less than one. And then here is the 16.9. This is the hour in a cutoff, what we calculated. And then showed, okay, this is the number. So there are this much of proteins and this much, uh, this much peptide per protein there. And then this is the, how we recognize the, your experiment design. And then it showed the progress over there. So I will co come back to the, right. I will come back to the some questions. So from the bottom, so normalization, if the experiment is the dilution series to say that low the proteins, this is hard. So in the cases we cannot use to equalize the medium. Also, so um, MS that uh, support four different, uh, uh, four different, or different uh, um, normalizations. So here, different normalization options. So you can see this one from the material. So here we have a new normalization option, means we are not touching it. So if you already have a, uh, your input already normalized, you can just check this one is false, normalization option. You can just replace this is a false and then you are not doing anything at all. So this is a, one of the example for SRM. So SRM with the heavy label cases, we always use this heavy label one. So without the normalization, this is how it originally looked like. Um, but if you, you use the, our default one, the equalized media normalization means so we want to make this median equalized across to everywhere, and then just apply the same shift to the corresponding to the endogenous one. So it should be look like this. If you don't, we don't have, have this reference channel, we only focus on this part, this part. So which means I already said, we have a big assumption that the majority of the protein do not change in the crystal wise. So, but dilution series, yes it is. And then we are now recommend to use the, our default and even quantile too. So quantile means we make a distribution is equalized. So which means if you have a really big outlier, they actually just want to bring up to here. Actually, we have a lot of the data manipulation for quantile normalization. So for quantile normalization also, we, this one, this normalization required a larger number of the protein, larger number of the peptide, and so on. The last one is for global standard normalization, which means we know that some specific protein or peptide should be equal amount across the lines. And then use that specific, um, the peptide or um, the peptide or protein make uh, to equalize across the line. So in that case is a dilution series. When you really, you think about the dilution experiment, uh, we recommend to spike in one or a few proteins um, the uh, spike in same amount, and then we can use this one for normalizations. Also, this uh, normalization also can be option for other um, other um, experiments for AP study or something like this. So uh, this is a for normalization we support. Right, so in which is a sample is also kind of this, you know, we can use the global standard normalizations uh, uh, options. But if, you, yeah, so normalizations that why, um, this is also very important. And then sometimes it's really picky, but if you really obvious cases, we already rec always recommend, think about the normalization first at the, you know, design of your experiment stage. 
if nothing, if you are done whatever you want, and then you want to normalize it, it's really hard to do it. So think about the normalization factor when you design the experiment. So for uh, MaxCon LFQ data, I think it's our default is we just use the intensity, not the LFQ intensity. I cannot remember we actually have an option to uh, select um, the LFQ intensity. Um, yeah, I, but I need to double check this one. Um, then let's see, this is still working, okay. For um, some data processing, DIA 45 minutes, large 20, larger 20, 20, 40 minutes, it should be 20, not 20 hours, right? Right. Yes, so for DIA case, like up to 30, 40, around the 5,000 protein, my just um, normal, the map book, just it takes like 30 minutes and 40 minutes and so on. And when even your 20, uh, the 32 gigabyte, mine is a 16 gigabyte. This is, a, it, it is usual. We, yeah, we are trying to um, make better than this. For SRM, I'd like to normalize the by equalize the median of reference by gain standard and then and then apply global standard. Is it possible? Is it possible? But um, currently, MS does support only one normalization for one step. So for this one, we need some manual manual work in the R, unfortunately, yes. And actually this is what exactly what we do for one of the biomarker study, um, the MCP uh, to SRM, like bigger data set um, over, no, uh, over intensive data set. So probably I will put us some link how we normalize this, this kind of cases in the Google Doc. Um, So what is the difference between the biological protein level and the te technical replicate protein summarization? So for data processing step, we are not uh, record, we are not distinguish biological replicate and technical replicate. For data processing step, we are only focused on run and feature. Run doesn't matter, it should be group, biological replicate, technical replicate, it doesn't matter at all. So for data processing step, we report the run protein level summarizations. However, after that, we have a quantification function, which is support two different summarization. One is the each sample quantification or group uh, quantifications. So for example, if you don't have a technical replicate, so every run is a biological replicate for each group. That is the same as a biological replicate protein summary. If you have a biological replicate and technical replicate, the, the data processing output is bi technical biological replicate and technical replicate level summarization, but the quantification function report the biological replicate summarization, which actually just median of technical replicate summarizations. Um, for for a larger data set for MS that um, we have a several contributors to um, um, to help some clustering something, but we tested several different cases. Actually, uh, some cases of this clustering doesn't work uh, at all. So we currently just stop to use it just in case. But I believe for next version we have a better um, we have a better option for these cases. So imputation happened this data processing function. So data, again, the data processing function, uh, normal, the raw transformation, um, normalization, impute the missing value, and the summaries for each uh, run levels. Again, for uh, missing value, how important. So uh, if you, we go back to the, uh, 
I will just pop up. Okay, so I will go ahead. Maybe it will take a, a big file. So here, so let's come back to the data processing one. So here now, this is one. This is just, um, don't worry. This is not the error message. This is a warning message. Just give the warning. Some protein have a not converging and then some, uh, they have a do some alternative options. So here, all data processing output save is the quant um, skyline. So it showed how the quant skyline. This is not a one table, this is the list type. So they actually have a several tables. They include the several tables. So the, the most important thing is this two, two, one. So let's say how quant skyline processing data look like. This one is really similar as our input to clean up the required format. It actually adds some additional column just for calculation wise. And then here they have a original, they have original intensity. And then here's the abundance column, which means a transformed and then normalized um, the values. And then they also have a fraction. Uh, even though you don't put the fraction, we automatically generate a fraction, which means if you don't have a fraction, we just put the just one and everywhere. And then here's also column censored one not based on our uh, calculation in the data processing. So here you can see all the first, but somewhere their censored is true and which is um, we imputed. And then the second one is the run level data, which is uh, run level summarized data. So now we have a little bit different column. And then here for each run, for each proteins, we said this is the our summarization. So for each run, each protein, we have now one value. And they show for this um, number is okay from how many features. And then for this summarization, did, did we impute the missing value? Um, did we meet, uh, impute the missing value? How many missing value they have? And, and so on. And then also condition and then and so on. So for further statistical analysis, we use this run level information. So I remember one of the question was, can we use the, our um, you know, transformation and normalization, but if you want to use the another statistical tools, yes, you can. You can just use this run level data set if you want to use the our summarization method. Or if you just use the normalized data set, you can add, yes, you can. You can use this process data and then you have to use these abundance columns. Right, so this two uh, one is important. So, and then before we go to the statistical analysis, we have our several visualization options, which I really like it. So we uh, support the three different uh, ones. So one is a QC plot, just to show the, all the, you know, this, um, um, the low transform in, uh, intensity per each one. And then also we can check the individual, individual um, the values. So for example, here, let's go. Uh, we already generate. This part is a really uh, take a long. Uh, you, you can also check the, the options if you do the question mark data process the plot. You show the all the option. So you, you if you can see here, you can customize uh, the x axis range of axes and then the you know size of axis, text size, dot size. A size of width and height for the plot. And this one is also very important, which protein. You can plot all of them, or you can specify the one specific protein or subset of the um, data set. And also you can, you can draw the original plot and summarize the plot. Okay, so what is the summarization plot means? Okay, if you have uh, some technical replic uh, question, I will cover it later. Um, so here, if you choose all means you're gonna draw the a plot for all the proteins. So here is, how it look like. And then here is a summarization plot. So, so 
from one function, we can, so if you say true means you can, you can if you summarize it plus true means you also want to draw the, this one for, so we are not going to draw the, this one for. So for example, this is a one part, one protein. So this specific protein, there are one, two, three, five, four, six, seven, eight, um, the features there. And then here you can see this is a MS run. And then this is Y axis of load intensity. And each dot is each peak intensity, log transform each peak intensity. And then it's a line is a link for each feature. So you can see, for example, this case is this you know, green one is quite flat. Uh, across the feature, but blue one is a little bit, um, the variation is a little bit up and down and up and down, right? So this is original the feature level um, data. And then after our summarization, maybe imputed and then to comedian one here, this is a green, gray one is exactly same as this. So just, we just changed the color, but the red, dark red one is, this is the, our summarized value. So, and then we are going to use this red, red one. So here for one file, here you can see 30, 27 proteins. If you can scroll down, you can see all the proteins, how it look like, you know, here. For example, here, this case is the empty dot, it means this is the, you know, the sensor to missing. You know, here, there's no, here means this is the sensor missing, but here's the, Nothing there means NA, this is just randomly, you know, happen. So you can see over here, and then you also can see all the proteins there. But it takes a while for generator, you know, um, a lot of things. So in that case, you can specify, you can specify the protein, proteins there. So here, this P4415, 015 is one of the spiking proteins which should be changes across the conditions. So I just specify this protein and then just draw it. This is uh, how it looks like. And then this is it. So here for these cases, we can see um, condition two is really up and down. And then here you can see some of the features really up and down and up and down, like really noisy there. And then here we can see there are a lot of the sensor value. And then here you can, we can find what is the hour summarized value which we are gonna use the test. So that is the, uh, the, um, the visualization one. And also here's also another option for data processing. So if you don't want to impute, you can just change this one from true to false here. You can also change this summarization. If you don't want to, to immediate one, you can, we can have option for linear. So it's an average based summarizations. You can also do it. And then this is also most recent part, recent update about the feature selection, which is published, uh, I think it's the last, last month about the feature selection, which means we recognize the outliers and then we recognize uninformative features. And then this kind of information, uninformative the feature we are not using for our summarizations. So to, to do this, we have a two options here, two options. The feed, the feed, feature subset high quality means we want to find the high quality features basically. And then also for this option, we have another one is a top N, top three, means we are gonna use the top three, top five features only. So if you have a like DIA data, it's a hundred or thousands of the, you know, peptide there, you can choose like top N. Um, so, and then people ask, so what is the top N? What is the best top N? So based on our, it's hard to say what is exactly the best one. It can be different by the data set and then processing tool. But for our, based on our experience, up to 30, up to 30 features, top 30 feature is quite good enough. Um, relatively very similar with the all features. And then here, this option means we select it. And then we also need this option again, the remove of informative the features outlier truths. If this is a false, we just detect it, but we still use all of them. If you select the true, and then we are gonna remove this. So this is also the, our, uh, 
the feature selection part. So I have to speed up for last part, but I will just check in uh, some other questions. When you know what? So uh, when we select the feature, actually that is a base on normalization. So always normalization we are doing the first and then select the features. So after select the feature, we are not doing the normalization again. Um, so um, we don't have a mean normalization option. So yeah, we are just doing the median normalizations. Okay, so then we can move on to the last part for group comparison. For group comparison, uh, before uh, here, this is a group comparison functions, but group comparison function need a two input. One is the processed data. One is the processed data here. Uh, we, our process data is a quant skyline. So output of the data processing should be our data input. And then we have to tell which comparison do you want to compare? We have to tell the contrast metrics. So this one, unfortunately you have to set it up. So I believe most of cases we have a two, three cases, quite simple. However, uh, in R, I always recommend to check this one because it can be also different by alphabetic order or something actually how the R recognized order of the condition might be different. So here, fortunately, the, here you can see here, there are condition one, two, three, four. There are four condition in this data set. And then level is how they are recognized this con the condition is condition one first and then two, three, four. Uh, however, if you have a healthy disease, even though you have a healthy first, uh, probably are recognized um, this condition information alphabetic order. So probably disease first and then healthy. So when we define the, this one, so disease minus healthy or healthy minus disease is really depending on this order. So always check this order first. And then here is so you have to set it up. So for example, here, uh, there are four conditions we want to make a pairwise comparison. So if one, two, three, four, so four times three times divided by two. So we, up to we have, we can make the six of the pairs. So we first, we can state um, condition two minus condition one, condition three minus one, four minus one, and so on. So in that case, we have to make uh, some metrics for uh, each uh, cases. So now we have a one, two, three, four condition. So make a force space and then um, we have to tell them so condition two minus one means one times condition two minus one times condition one and then we are not consider the condition three and four so you have to put a zero zero on it and then we have to say also how we are gonna recognize this condition uh, this um, the, the comparison between these two. So here, if you run this one, so now comparison, I want a six comparisons uh, between uh, across the four condition. And then here's the, I set it up. And then here you can run um, group comparisons. So one advantage for here, we use the linear mixed model. So beyond the pairwise comparison, we have a linear comparison, linear metrics. So for example, we can compare a condition, mean of condition one and two versus mean of condition three and four and, and so on. So if you have a multiple comparison, um, at the complex design, we can actually manage how we can compare based on your hypothesis over here. So this is a running. Uh, I will check the also uh, questions. Um, right. Okay.
So I will show you some examples. So one of the question is, if we have a condition is completely missing, that is also really common questions. So ideally, if one condition is completely missing, means we think that is right because there's no protein at all for the specific conditions. And then this is what, what we are interested in, right? However, uh, for statistical wise, if they have an, any value, if there's no value at all, no value versus some value, we cannot apply the same linear mixed models. In that case, um, we actually cannot report uh, like low, you know, any four changes um, or something. If you really want to find this one, we uh, there are several methods for um, just a G test, just you know, based on count, count one. Actually, this is really depending on the count, um, the condition or something. But this is also kind of different uh, statistical method to detect this one for same category about this. In, um, uh, our model, we cannot do this. However, we just report as it is. So we report, we cannot do this. So we just report, we cannot calculate the standard error NA. We cannot calculate the degree of freedom NA. We cannot calculate the p-value NA, just NA. However, we just mark at or just p-value is zero, zero. And then after this one, I will show you, we also have some extra column. So some issue column um, and then some comment. So issue column means we just flag it. Okay, this is the object's p-value is zero. However, that is because we just put the, uh, we suspect this is something happened. One condition is completely missing. So we just mark one condition is completely missing. So that's why we cannot calculate the p-value. Uh, uh, however, we just check, uh, check the you know, directions. So, so it might be the log, it log, um, estimate log uh, for changes infinity or minus infinity. So based on plus minus direction, you can you know see which one have a value, which one have a doesn't have a value. But we actually market this. So we also uh, recommend to list of this kind of protein separately. Uh, Right. So here we go. So now the sky a uh, test skyline have a result. The test skyline also have let's check the names test skyline. So now we have a three different this is a list of three different um, data I have. So one is a comparison result which include the estimate for changes p value one. And the model QC is just in the QC part, like, you know, based on, we can, we can just check the assumption about the linear models. And the fit the model is really our model for each, each protein, how we fit the model. So if you want to further um, investigation, we can also use this. But most likely, most of people are interested in this comparison result, then how it look like. Skyline result, so here we go. So here, for each proteins, for this specific comparison, this is the our estimate log two for changes and standard error and degree of freedom, p-value, or just p-value, and then here's a missing or um, issue and the missing percentage in imputation percentage. So now here's a new issue, but as I mentioned, if something is completely um, the missing, uh, one condition is missing, we just mark it. This is a one condition is completely missing and so on. And also we just mark um, percentage of the missing for this specific um, the pairs. Um, and then you can see this value is based on how much missing value and imputed the percentage and so on. So here, so uh, after this, we can also save this one as a CSV file. And then we can check the, uh, what is the significant list. So for example, here's guideline the widget to we can filter or just p-value is less than 0.5. Here, now we have a 29 rows, which means 29, 14, and the um, 
a comparison, they are significantly different. So you can see here is a list of the adjust p-value is point, uh, less than 0 0.05. And then also we can apply the, at the four change cutoff. Okay, among them, I want to add one more criteria. I want a list of the estimate four changes is bigger than two. And then they just listed, list them all. And then here now we have a quite smaller number of comparison and protein list um, satisfy this criteria. Okay, so this is the, our result. So based on this group comparison, we also uh, provide the several visualization option. One is the common one is a volcano plot. For volcano plot, also we can um, set up the different cutoff. So for example, let's see, here's a volcano plot. Now for C2 versus group uh, condition two versus condition one, this is the, how it looked like. And then they just list of each um, proteins, are, which proteins are significantly different. Um, and then if you apply the four change cutoff, they also line up here. And then here, for example, here, this one is uh, quite smaller for changing than what we want here for changes cut off four. Um, and then this one is a still uh, significantly uh, difference. So uh, there are also options if, uh, this is a very unique cases, but mostly biological study, they probably have a lot of the dot over there. And then this naming is really can messy. You can also have some option to remove this. So for example, here, group comparison, plot options. Here you can see the protein name true. You can replace this one protein name false, and then you can change this. Um, and so on. So that is the whole workflow for hypothesis and testing part. But we also have an extra functionality. One is um, calculate the power and then sample size. So we have a design sample size functions. So based on our estimate the variance component, we actually calculate the power and statistical analysis. So it should be our testing a result in output from the group comparison. And then if you design, uh, uh, set the desire for changes, um, the FDR cutoff, and then what is the number of the sample size, you can calculate the power. For example, uh, if you have a three sample per conditions, and, and then for example here, you have a 90% to truly detect this much for changes. Other also one is the sample size calculation. Also from the same um, input, input is output of the group comparison. So here means I want 90% power with uh, this FDR cutoff. Then um, for example here, if you want 1.24 changes with this much power with this much FDR, you need 11 sample per group. So this is means if you design the further experiment based on this pilot study, which means we assume that probably your next future experiment should have a very similar variance component. And based on this calculation, you need this sample size. And also here, you can also draw the, yeah, this is uh, means, mm -hmm. Here we go. So you can also draw the, this um, um, the visualization. And then this one is the last part for sample of the uh, subject quantification. As I briefly mentioned, um, the data processing uh, function report the run level summarization. If you want a subject run, uh, uh, level summarization here, quantification. So they use the data processing uh, one and then this one report for each proteins what is our sample quantification. So, uh, as I mentioned, this experiment is a very specific. They have only one biological replicate for one condition, so they report as this much. Um, so yes, so this is the our um, the whole workflow for um, the 
uh, MS did. If we go back to the our data set, you know, we just practice one of these. Uh, each one is one of the example for different tools. So for example, let's open the max quant, and then here's the max quant uh, example script. So here, the bottom is uh, the later one is uh, different, but it, it will be quite a simple uh, way you how you use the max quant. So for mass quant output, we need the evidence file and protein group files. So we mainly use the evidence file, which is a feature level data set, feature level peak intensity. We use the protein group um, file, not for the protein quantification, just for protein ID, just you know, for some matching for um, the protein ID. But we, mainly we use the evidence file uh, peak intensity one. So we read this to one. And still you need to make annotation files. Based on this, you can just use the MaxQuant converter and afterwards it is the same as other tools. Also, you can see the progenesis examples over there. And then here for DIA um, uh, data set, I already over the time, um, this is the, what the Brandon practiced uh, last week. Uh, and then what the Olga show, what is the difference this two. So there are two folder, one is the all and the low CV. And then each one case is what is the report from Skyline and the script. Script is exactly same in, except the input. And then which means we just use the different input and then go through the exactly same way. And then we actually can see the how it's a different, um, differently concluded. So um, this is the, our, uh, I just showed the here, just put the, some example for DDA cases. However, probably you use other tools like DIA or uh, something else. Um, so that moment I will just show the massive sequence shortly. This one actually have a 42 public data set, which include the quantification, R script, annotation, and then the statistical analysis. Um, Analysis, analysis result. So for example, here, if you click the data, it showed all the 42 data set is already filled in. Uh, if you use the um, um, DIA cases, I, we have a one, um, We have a one data set. Uh, we have a one data set of processing across the I compile skyline spectral not open open source or every all the you know quant data set and the R script there. I will also make a link in the, our Google Doc. If you use the, one of the tools and then want to use the example R script, you also can use um, that script one. Okay, so I will answer, check the, the question. Um, so I'm sorry, I already, you know, use all my time and then 20 minutes over. Um, then um, this is all I prepared. So if you have a question, just email me. If you have extra uh, question, please uh, put the question and answer here. I will stay here like 20 minutes more. I will try to answer if they have advanced um, question, I will try to answer here um, and then copy all the question in the Google Doc. So if um, that is all we have, so thank you for joining. And let me use this opportunity to thank uh, Mina and thank everybody for uh, joining us. So tomorrow we'll talk more about massive quant. If you're interested in that, please, uh, come back tomorrow and we will also talk about uh, MS that's TMT. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So I will stay here for like 20 minutes or something. So feel free to stay and then leave. Yeah. Okay. So then I will answer some questions. Um, okay. So simple question first. 
For sample size calculation, is the calculation number represent the number of the pair sample? It is depending on the experiment design. So as I mentioned, pair design, group comparison, time courses, we apply the different statistical model. We calculate a different variance component. Based on different basal component, we actually calculate the, um, the sample size. So you don't need to worry about it. The sample size is based on your um, the, uh, experiment design. Okay, so Q and A session, yes, uh, yeah. I also think like you know this tutorial, like there are right range of the people about ex you know, exposed to how much uh, MS debt, and then I think this is a really good chance to a Q and A. Absolutely, we actually can save all the question um, question in one place. So I will try to make document as much as possible in the our Google Doc, um, maybe today and up to tomorrow. Yeah. Could you is include a you know PD, uh, PD example? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. You actually can um, see. Maybe I will just share my screen again. So, um, PD. I know one of the examples, but definitely I will make a link later. Um, here we go. Uh, Right, we are gonna dig into how we we can use um, this one again. Um, this is the one of this also spike in data set uh, here. Yeah, you don't need to worry about this one. You don't need to mark it, but I will make the link. We have an example here. So for example, here, PD, PD discover one, right? So here we just process by the proteome discover you can FDB download and then you can download all the script and, and so on. So yes, I will make a link there. So I will answer this question later. Okay, can you report the number of the unique peptide used for quantification of each protein um, and protein group. Up. Yes, we, we can update this somehow, but you know, currently I think what we have, if you go back to the hour one quantification, it's not this, okay, here. So, right, yeah, we can, we are going to think about a little bit more how we can report more accurately. Uh, here is the run level data, right? Here, for example, here we have kind of, we have, so for example, here for each run, each protein, we said we use the eight features. Uh, and then our default is always use the unique peptide. So it should be unique number. But yeah, actually, we can label in. Um, 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 more accurately, right? Um, about the contrast, contrast metrics group comparison, yes. I know it's just, we also heard a lot of the feedback about this one. Um, we are also think about how to make a better way to, or easy to use it, yes. It's, we are trying to make a simplify. Uh, yeah, we are, we, are, we are gonna consider how we can make this one too easy to make it. Um, actually, um, tomorrow, maybe, I don't know, we have a lot of time to do this or not. Um, massive quant inside of this is also support the uh, MS that automatic MS that real analysis. But there's also option, you don't need to set up the which comparison do you want, automatic setup, um, the pairwise comparison wise. Yeah, we can also cover that one tomorrow too. Um, so, okay, here's a one question about the comparison metrics. This is quite Okay, this is a good case. I will just type in here. This is just extra. Okay. 
there's one rule. Rule one for set up the comparison matrix. Uh, sum of sum of this constant should be zero, right? So here means okay. Here's a one versus this is a zero, total zero, right? Um, if you want to compare mean of condition one two versus the mean of condition three four, how we can set it up is this like this. Right, because because this is how we can confirm is mean of one two is c one plus c two divided by two. Right, this is the mean, and then versus c three plus c four divided by two. So mean of c one versus mean of c three c four is this one. So we will say this is versus should be just minus. Right. Then how we can say this one is um, here, we can just write it down differently, 0. 0.0 times C1, right? And then plus 0. 0.5 times 2 minus 0. 0.5 times C3 minus 0. 0.5 times C4, right? Then, how we made it, we just use this constant in the matrix. And we'll just move on this to here, right? Oh, oh, only difference is here, I just, I just, yeah, I just see, I just change the order, right? So then this one should be make, matching this one. So this one, this one is kind of the picky, but actually we have a result. Which means, for example, here, how we can interpret this is minus C1 plus C2 minus C3 plus 0 times C4, which means, so C4 is gone, C2 minus C1 plus C3, right? So I don't know if this is meaningful or not, um, but is this it actually working? It's working. So you can compare C2 versus C1 and the sum of C1 and C3. So yes, in the cases we can do it, um, but you know we also need to rephrase how we can write your hypothesis. Hypothesis. So, right, so here's also another um, thing is, here we go. Um, I don't know if you notice or not, um, but for volcano plot, here, so we said the four changes, not the log, log four changes. You know, we always report the log intensity and log two four changes, but here is a you know, four changes. So that's why I just put the two, two D two, two, two D two, so it should be four. So if you go back to our volcano plot one, so here, here see, so four changes is a four, right? So if you wanna set up the um, four changes, like for example, 1.5, you I recommend a 1.5, uh, um, four changes like this, but for low, scale wise if you look at the 1.5 you have to write it down this one right uh, so for example four times two is a 16 right that is because two to the two to the two so this is actually same as two to the four so yeah so this is one of the questions over there Okay. Okay, so here's also a question about the time course, time course design. So maybe I will show you one of the syllabus 
um, traces. Um, this is time course. It's not a spike in data set. This is the time course one. Mm, so this is the backup. Here's the profile. Let's look at the profile. No, yeah, let's look at the profile of some summarization. So here we go. So this level data set, I just um, remind the experiment design. They have a six different time point, six zero, uh, time point zero, and 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, nine minutes, 100, uh, 120 minutes. Of, um, they have a three, three samples, three east, east samples. So, and then one, two, three, 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 right? So the question was, question was how to analyze and visualize the time course comparison data. And then how can we set up the time course comparison? Um, would you create a matrix with all the combinations possible? Okay, so make automatic metrics one. Yeah, I already heard a lot of the, um, the comment today. So we are gonna make this one, uh, however, this is how visualize. So visualize, you know, one of uh, the pro profile one, we always uh, separate by group. So for example, group comparison case, not the pair design one, uh, each one should be different. But here uh, for time course design, we assume one, two, three, one, two, three is matching. I, okay, I think this is a good idea. We just labeling for time courses uh, is that um, uh, MS run or also plus the biological replicate. Okay, I'll, we will try to update this one. Uh, comparison um, design wise, we always compare time courses always between the time course. So time course, we are not compared different by the biological replicate. So for example, here we want to compare 15 minutes versus zero minute, 30 minutes bef uh, versus zero minute or something. So in that case, time course is the same as group. So if you go back to the our script, So yeah, here's a uh, script here. So we have a uh, one zero to five, so six time courses, and then we just set up the our comparison like this. But yeah, yeah, we will try to update it how um, easy to make the compa uh, comparison metrics one. So data processing function, yes. So for um, computational time-wise, um, the visualization for especially the uh, profile plot, uh, QC plot, comparison plot, it will take a while because we just generate every uh, plot for all, every single proteins and then merge to the one PDF file. Um, for um, computational wise, so we have a main two function data processing and then group comparison. So data processing function actually it takes a while. Um, um, the main part, the main part is absolutely imputation, imputation procedures. And then the, uh, the two key medium summarize the procedures. And then so let's say for DDA cases, now it takes a little bit longer for, you know, for example, DDA skyline cases, 12 run, and then 3,000 3, proteins there for my computer is like three minutes or four minutes. Um, I mean, the imputation, everything. Uh, if we have a feature selection option on, uh, it will take a double up. So for example, for DDA cases, this case is like three minute takes, it will take like six, seven minutes. For DIA case, if it takes a 30 minutes without the feature selection option, it will take a like double up like kind of one hours. So yeah, that is because of the looping things. Uh, we are also trying to yeah, apply rule. Um, yeah, we are working on to improved our computation time right now. So, um, so we have a question about the phosphoproteomics. Um, pro, uh, yes, so for the um, phosphoproteomics, 
uh, protein mix, you're more interested in the peptide level, right? So you want to do the peptide level. And also some people also want to do the peptide level conclusion, not the protein level. In that case, it's simple. So uh, let's go back to the our input. Mm. Our input. So after converter function. So for example, after converter function, this is how it looks like. So we have a protein name and then the, uh, the peptide sequence and so on. Simple way so you can just replace this peptide level as a protein level as a peptide sequence or combination of the peptide, a protein level and then peptide. And then it will just um, run by each um, the peptide sequence because all the processing, the data processing and group comparison uh, it, um, is performed by each unique ID for this specific column. So if you modify this column, you can actually work in for the peptide one. This is a basic um, the analysis used the MSDAT, but we'll got briefly mention about it. We are also working for uh, MSDAT PTM one. Uh, it will have a very similar workflow, but conclusion wise, it will have it will be a little bit different. And then um, we are working on it. Um, hopefully, we can do by end of this year. Okay, so this one is also I answered. So there are some normalization, um, a question about the normalization. So I will read it. To normalize only heavy reference, would MS that do this automatically if we just designate the normalization equal, equal to the median in the process? Yes. Or do I need to specify somehow normalize? No. So if we have a heavy and reference, automatically we, re we use the heavy reference because we always assume this heavy reference should be equal amount across the run. And then we think this is really heavy reference, not heavy uh, conditions. So you don't need to worry about it. You can, you know, the MS that just use um, the heavy uh, reference for normalizations. All right, and then how many people are there right now? Okay, so we have a still 60, yeah, more than 60 people there. Um, recommend this configuration for laptop and computer. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so far, we don't have, uh, we don't have much chance to really, really big data, like, you know, several hundred gigabyte or something. If R can handle it so far, so good, so far, so good. I think so I will have a better uh, answer. Um, maybe if you, after we finished our MSDM refactoring one. Um, yeah, unfortunately right now I don't have it. How does MSD report the proteins that is missing in one biological replicate but present in other repli biological replicate under the same condition? Also, sometimes I got an you know, NA in the output order. I'm okay. So I think that is okay. Maybe I will open the our so new one. So I think this is also pattern of the missing value one. So let's say we have a condition. So, and then here, let's say condition two. Let's say we have a biological replicate one, biological replicate two, three. I don't know if this is big enough. So four, five, 
right? And then let's say we just think about our protein level. So everything is done, just we summarize in the protein level and then we are ready to forward the testing. So this is a protein. Well, let's say we have a value, 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 value. We commonly call this as a balance, which means we don't have any missing value. It's a completely filling and then we can test it. So we just compare three and then three, right? So if we have some missing, so here, if you have a one biological replicate missing, we can still test. We still have a two versus three. We can still test it. Here, we also missing one biological replicate for the cases. Still, we can do this, right? However, if we don't, if we have this case, if you have only one, one, we can calculate the estimate for changes, just the difference between these two but we cannot calculate the variance and then we cannot calculate um, our p-value. And then also let's say if we have a two, but if you have a complete missing, still we cannot do this. So I think sometimes you got number and name, that the shop name is for changes. I guess, I guess, I think you open them. I think you open the Excel. That is because probably we re I report the, minus infinity, minus infinity, yeah, here we go. So, so actually we report, um, for example, let's see our group comparison uh, here. So now, so for example, um, okay, let's go back to our case here. Let's say we have this case, right? We have a conditions um, this condition and this condition, and then this condition is completely missing, right? In that case, let's say we want to compare C con condition one minus condition two. How MS the report is, this is a law for, for change. We report this minus this, we report infinity, and then other column is NA. NA, 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 and then like issue column is one condition missing, completely missing, right? If you set up the your comparison C2 minus C1, so here empty minus this, we actually import this is minus infinity, right? Then it will be NA and NA, NA. I think this is the case. If you see that this row with this uh, NA, probably this is a one condition missing or two condition missing. That is my guess. If not, um, just let us know. I think I answered pretty much um, all the questions. So um, thank you for being here quite a long time. Um, probably I will answer one more question. Um, so. Just, just one more time. I think so people say they have some issue for, um, they cannot find error message said something, something they cannot read open. That means, which is what I miss. So at the beginning, at the beginning, you have to go to the, you have to go to the folder. You have to go to the folder where's this input folder you have, go to this one and then click here more, click set as working directory, then it should work. So I think I missed this part. So I hope this one can help um, to solve the issues. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I will, oh, we have a, wow, more than 100 questions. I will list up all the questions and then make a Q and A uh, the, um, q and one in the Google Doc. Um, I hope this one can helpful. Uh, I also post uh, some solution for people who have an issue for install MS that external tool in Skyline. Um, we report the same uh, error message, so we fix it. So we updated the new version over there. So if you are not completely removing uninstall the, the R and package, probably they will keep error message. So I recommend to completely remove the uninstall the, the R and package. So this, I just put over there. Um, for 
also another one is for external tool. Uh, if you have a computer from the, your company, they have extra uh, protections, extra uh, things you have to take care of. So when you try to install like some open source, they actually block it. So in the cases need to work with um, the IT person in the company, they can help you to install the R or required one. So thank you so much for staying here a long time. Um, um, and again, just to wrap up, um, we are working for refactoring for MSDAT and then speed one, the RAM memory issues. Uh, we are really trying to hard to solve this one. Hopefully we can release the in MSDAT 4.0 for next October. And then thank you for all the feedback. Um, and then, um, and then you're interested for the MSA TMT and the MSA Quant one. Uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, bye.